everyone and welcome to our webinar hosted by the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. I uh, just wanted to note that this is a re-recording of the webinar that was presented on April 9th, 2020. My name is Krista Costas Bradstreet. I'm the Director of Policy and Partnerships for CPRA and I'm pleased to host today's webinar. Uh, first, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is a very stressful time that everyone's experience and I'm experiencing and I hope that you and your families and co-workers are managing as best you can. And of course, it's because of these circumstances that the webinar was put together. With many people now working from home, our members asked if we could provide a webinar that offered some insight into ways to make this time the most productive. So just before we get to that, I wanted to provide a very quick introduction to CPRA. CPRA has uh, a strategic outlook that you can find um, on our website and it goes from 2019 to 2021. We have three strategic goals. We are a national voice for parks and recreation, advancing the collective interests of our members. CPRA is a community, so we're a national network dedicated to the well-being of people, communities, and the natural and built environments. And we're a service provider, so we provide services for our members and partners that cultivate dialogue, learning, and innovation. CPRA is a collective of networks from all 13 uh, provinces and territories. We have um, a board of directors. We have the 13 provincial and territorial staff. We have volunteers across the country, government partners, allied sectors such as physical activity, recreation, education, uh, public health, uh, all that help us contribute to moving our strategic goals forward. We have a very small team, so we have a national office that includes a uh, CEO, uh, myself as Director of Policy and Partnership, Director of Communications, and an Administrator. Just uh, as we've been dealing with all of the COVID-19 related uh, things going on, we are trying to provide some support for the sector as well. So each week we talk to our 13 provincial and territorial members and they provide regional updates as to what, how they're dealing with the crisis. Um, and then they also identify some of their needs uh, for their sector on behalf of the sector. We've been monitoring, updating and guiding um, federal government aid programs. We're actively advocating the federal government for financial support for the sector, both now and as we look to the recovery phase. We're working with our national partners, including the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Participation to align advocacy efforts. We're sharing information and ideas on social media and we're providing tools to support the sector, such as this webinar. If you have or need any additional support, please let us know and we can provide it at, um, it, it, sorry, we can provide it online for everybody, but if you'd reach out to info at cpra.ca, we will get as much information out to the sector as we can. So with that, I would like to um, now begin the more formal part of our webinar and introduce our speaker, one of our two speakers, uh, Michelle Bush. Michelle is the owner of Meglin Consulting. With 30 years of experience in human resources, Michelle now helps businesses to improve their productivity and employer brand through leadership behavior and employee engagement. Michelle is also a certified coach practitioner and career transition specialist, providing customized career change and job search support for her clients. Michelle's known for being a progressive and inspiring mentor and has developed a reputation for helping business leaders and clients to realize their full potential. Michelle has worked in both private and public sectors with entrepreneurs, large multinational and global corporations across various industries. Michelle holds a degree in psychology and a business diploma from Wilf Wilfrid Laurier University, an executive management certificate from McMaster's degree at School of Business, and she is a certified facilitator and adult education trainer. So thank you so much, Michelle, for um, leading us through working from home today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Krista. I appreciate the introduction and thank you all for attending, for taking time to pause. It's an opportunity to pause and to explore some various ways to cope with working from home. Um, before we get started, just make sure that you have something to jot some notes down on. Uh, during the session, I'm going to be asking a few questions as we go through the content, and it's a bit of self-reflection here and there, so not expected to share, and share any of the content, but the, uh, the opportunity to ask yourself some questions as we go through this 
will help us to identify how we can deal with some of the broad range of reactions and impacts that we're having. And to say that there is a broad range of reactions and impacts to this situation is really an understatement. So if we could go to the next slide. You can see here that there are so many things that might be going through our heads at this time. Um, some of us may be really enjoying the fact that we have an opportunity to work differently. We may not have to commute the two hours a day that we did before. Maybe we have the chance to just rock out to ACDC if we want to and without uh, bothering coworkers. And others are really missing the interaction and the routine and random chats around the water cooler. And for some of us, this may actually not be that different. We may have been working at home for years, and so this is just a slightly different uh, dynamic for us. But whatever your situation is, there's three things that are important to remember. And the first one is to acknowledge this new dynamic. Acknowledge how this new dynamic is impacting you. And don't ignore the stresses or the anxieties that pop up, but instead identify where they're coming from. The second thing is to find out when it comes to working from home, working at home, uh, what works for you. So whether this is familiar to you or whether this is a brand new concept, it really, it's important for you to, to find your groove and see what works for you. And the third thing to think about is being cognizant of what others might be going through. So some people might be living alone and they're really just trying to endure the solitude Others might be dealing with the very unfamiliar and unexpected demands of having to homeschool young children and that might have thrown them for a loop. So during this, make sure that we're acknowledging, that we're assessing and that we're empathizing. And there's a lot of tips and suggestions about how to be productive when we're working from home. We see articles on the internet and posts on LinkedIn and maybe we're getting advice uh, from colleagues or from friends. And there's so much out there that it can be overwhelming. So what's really important about finding your groove when you're working from home is to identify which pieces of those pieces of advice might be causing you more anxiety than being helpful because maybe they don't apply to your situation or they aren't really aligned to who you are. So today's session really is about providing various ideas and alternatives it's about letting you discover what fits for you, help you sort of reframe your thinking. Uh, it, by no means is this going to be a list of, you know, Michelle's top 10 things that you should or shouldn't do because really one size absolutely does not fit all. So what's important though is we strike that balance. We have to find that balance between the work demands, those needs of our clients, our managers, our staff, and then those personal needs that we have to factor in, in terms of our way of working and what works best for us. So if you want to sleep in until 7 a.m. when you used to get up at six, that's okay. Just make sure that you're prepared and you're available for that 9 a.m. conference call. And then maybe you work a little bit later in the evening if that's what's gonna help you be at your most productive and as long as it's not a problem for your team. So find what works for you and go for it. What I wanna do is take a moment and consider two different approaches to working from home. So just high level, I'm gonna read out some words and what I'd like you to do is take notice of how the words make you feel. So what kind of a reaction are you getting when I describe these two different approaches? So the first approach, approach number one, it is start early, get dressed, put your shoes on, create a daily priority list, stick to it, maintain a strict schedule and a routine so that you don't get distracted and schedule timed breaks into your agenda. So that's number one. Approach number two is develop a routine that provides some parameters. When you are working, be purposeful and focused. Be clear about tasks and required outcomes, but be flexible in the way you tackle them stretched when the need arises, or if you want, throw in a load of laundry between calls because that's what you want to do on your break. So the reaction to these two particular approaches really can help you acknowledge which one puts you at the most productive. So you can see here on the screen, we have a couple of questions to ask yourself and there's no right or wrong answer. This is just self-reflection. 
So the first question is, you know, which one of these approaches resonated for you the most? Number one certainly is about structure and order. Number two is a little bit more about flexibility. So on a very high level, think about which one fits for you best. And then ask yourself that question of the approach that I didn't choose. So the one that didn't feel so good for me, what was it about that? Maybe I didn't like number one because it's just, it's too structured. I feel confined, I feel too regimented, and thank you very much, but no, I don't need to schedule my breaks into my agenda. Or does the thought of maybe a less prescribed or a more free-flowing approach, like the one in number two, maybe that gets you worried and makes you feel anxious because you don't think you're gonna be able to focus. So there may be elements of each one of these, of course, that are helpful, but overall, people tend to have a preference. And it's important for you also to take a note of who else needs to know about that approach. So is it a partner, a spouse, a team member, a manager? Share with those that you are working with or around so that they understand as well what your preferences are. And of course, your reactions to these approaches, they may or may not change over the next few weeks or the, the next few months. But by asking ourselves these questions, it can also help us to identify where some of our stresses or maybe some of our exhaustion, where it's coming from. Because working at home is not always that easy. So a quick story to illustrate. I have a business partner and, and she's struggling. We, I know that she's very much like structured uh, number one. She really likes to have things on time. And I've been sending, of course, follow-ups and emails and milestones and deadlines because I know that's how she likes to work. But she's actually not been feeling very good about all of this. And the, some of the critical projects that we've got on the go, she hasn't been able to keep up with. And she didn't want to tell me. Well, she has. she's in isolation, two school-aged children at home. She's now being expected to teach her son fractions and the new math, whatever the heck that is. And so once she shared her situation with me though, and we had a conversation about it, even though we couldn't keep to our original schedule, we had some discussions, we looked at options, allocated some tasks differently and adjusted some timelines. And we haven't changed our end goal, but we've had an opportunity to just reframe. So it's really important for us during these times to remain human, to give ourselves and to give others permission to rejig or to reorganize, reflect and rest, just so that we can continue to move forward in a forward momentum. And the reality is we still have work that we need to get done. So the next slide, please. So in these times, of course, just like the distillery that's now making hand sanitizer instead of gin or the vacuum company that's now making ventilators, we also are learning how to retool ourselves in some ways and to embrace these different ways of working that we find ourselves in. So remember that these new ways of working, especially when we're working from home, we are actually identifying some transferable skills. So whether we are building on an existing strength or maybe we're developing a new one, these competencies are things that are gonna help us now, they're gonna help us in the future, they'll help us at work and they'll actually help us at home. So things like resilience and flexibility and compassion or adaptability, all those kinds of words that indicate that we can retool and be flexible. So just another question for you to think about is, what is it that you have had to do differently in terms of your way of working at home as a result of this situation? And I'll give you an example to get you started. So I do Zoom calls and recordings whenever I need to. They're at my makeshift desk in my living room. I was a pseudo empty nester, but now I have two university students. They're back home and not a surprise, they have to eat. And the kitchen is right beside the living room. And we all know that smoothies in a blender are not very quiet. So what we now have to do is figure out that dynamic amongst ourselves. And instead of just doing my own thing, I now have to post a schedule so that they know when it's okay to make noise in the kitchen. So it's something that I've had to adjust to. So for yourself, just take a moment and jot down something that you've had to do differently now that you're working from home. And then we're actually going to explore some of the various ways that we can cope with working from home. We want to reframe our thinking. And I've broken it down into three parts. The first part is work. 
The second part is self. And then the third part, of course, is this interaction with the family and friends element that we're dealing with. So when it comes to the work demands, it's really important for us to think about our work space. So what does your physical workspace look like? Is it a makeshift office in the living room like myself? Like in the photo here, can you turn an unused closet into a, a workspace? Maybe you're under the stairs somewhere. I've heard of people actually even being in a walk-in closet so that they can have some quiet. But regardless of where that dedicated space is, please make sure that it's as ergonomic as possible. So you may not have all of the tools that you had if you were working back in an office environment, but use a back pillow or a second monitor. Make sure that you've got some good lighting and a mouse or a footrest, whatever it is that you need to do to make that space ergonomic, because this isn't just a you know, work from home day on just one day. This is unfortunately an extended period of time. So we have to make sure that we've got the right workstation for us. I myself even prop up my laptop from time to time and I make a standing desk for myself or I have a little cafe table downstairs with um, some chairs uh, in my basement. And so that cafe height allows me to actually have a bit of a different setup when I'm in the basement and I'm not sitting as long. Or maybe in your workspace, you need to mix things up a little bit. Take a call from the car, drive to a park, or have a walking, talking meeting. I'm sure your colleagues won't matter if there's some birds chirping in the background. So find a way to mix things up a little bit and have that workspace a little bit more of a change of scenery. And keep reminding yourself in all of these is that those transferable skills like adaptability and flexibility are gonna show up as we look at these different ways of working. So maybe you were resistant in an open office concept before you thought that you were unproductive because you had distractions of coworkers near you, but now you seem to be able to tune out the distractions of kids in the background and, and realized that an open office environment maybe isn't so bad after all. When it comes to work hours, ask yourself what your work day looks like. So maybe it's good to notably mark somehow the beginning and the end of your work hours. If you can set office hours, you know, I'm available between eight and two, and then I have some family commitments and I'm available back again at you know six o'clock at night for another couple of hours. Talk to your manager, talk to your coworkers, and see how you might be able to maybe think about your workday differently. Maybe it's the number of hours in a workday and what needs to get done, as opposed to when that actually needs to get done. So reframe that workday if you can. And there may be colleagues out there that are absolutely fine with doing a call at nine o'clock at night. Maybe for them, it's after their children's bedtime. For you, it's an opportunity to have got an evening workout in. So Think about where you can find things outside of those standard hours that might work for other coworkers. And if your to-do list is interrupted, be kind to yourself. You know, interruptions happened to us in the workplace before all of this. I myself had an interruption the other day. I was sitting at my desk and there was these little bundles of dog fluff under my desk that were rolling around and I, I was making me crazy and I couldn't concentrate on anything else. So I just took a 10 minute break, I vacuumed and then I was able to move on. So, you know, 80% of the dust is in 20% of the house. So clean that 20% if that's just what you need to do to calm yourself and take control and then move on. So we will have those interruptions and it's okay. And it's also important for us to have very candid conversations. So being honest about potential limitations when we're working from home. And certainly we still have that caveat that we have to get work done, but we wanna make sure that we're having dialogue and conversation so others know what we're going through and we know what they're going through. And if you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling a sense of generally unwell, talk to your manager. Don't be afraid to ask for help from coworkers. We still have the work demands that we did before, but they're now enveloped in this sort of constant cloud of news and worry and concern. So discuss with others how things might be able to be tackled differently and identify ways for yourself to just release that pressure valve a little bit. You know, acknowledge that this situation of this pandemic that we find ourselves in is taking up extra space in our brains. And so we just wanna make sure that we're being kind and, and having some grace. So that brings us to the third part of work, which is staying connected. So make sure that you can you know, schedule times for regular communication or check-ins, have virtual water cooler chats, communicate well 
communicate often. There's a lot of user-friendly project management tools and file sharing that allow us to keep track with others. You know, we want to make sure that we're not duplicating effort or that things aren't falling through the cracks. And documenting and sharing those action items and outcomes are even more important now that we're more spread out and that we're virtual. So I've been invited to Google Docs and to Microsoft Team, which are new to me. They're not my forte, but they're really not that difficult. They're fairly user friendly and they replace things like having to send email attachments all the time. And it certainly helps with some IT security. The other thing that's really important around staying connected in our communication is checking our tone. So we want to make sure that our verbal and our written communications, that those words and the intent aren't misinterpreted. And, and those can be misinterpreted at the best of times. And now, certainly under these stressful situations, we want to make sure that we're catching ourselves if we're sounding uh, negative or unclear. A really important way as well to stay connected in this virtual um, environment we find ourselves in is make sure that you're taking advantage of those virtual meetings and, and that you're present and that you're engaged. Uh, all ears will be on you when you have an opportunity to have a voice in those sessions. So if you've got a really valuable recommendation, take advantage of that, um, of that time that you're getting on that group conference call. And to lighten things up a little bit, just regarding the virtual meetings, there's certainly a lot of tips out there for effective video conferencing. And there's effectiveness, but then there's also keeping it interesting. So a couple of quick suggestions that might trigger some different thoughts and ideas for you to keep those virtual meetings interesting. One might be just have that meeting available access to the participants about 15 minutes ahead of time. So people who want to come on and chat and have that water cooler discussion and see how people are doing, that can take place before the meeting. Maybe something like, um, you know, we can't travel right now, of course, and go and see the world. So maybe go, we go around the world in 15 minutes with our colleagues. Maybe share some travel photos and spend the first little bit of a meeting um, having some photo share of places that we've been to. And preferably, there are shots of scenery and not poolside scenes of you doing shots. So be careful what pictures you bring in a little um, exercise like that. Maybe you can do things like fun socks or slippers or, you know, show your fancy footwear before a meeting, uh, a hat or an ugly Christmas sweater. Any of those kind of things can lighten things up a bit. Maybe an indoor scavenger hunt. So you create a list of items. People have to go around the house before the meeting, um, gather them and show a picture of themselves that they've done it. And they could be easy things like a, a broken watch or a magnet or a poppy, you know, something that you can find in that drawer uh, where things go to die. So try and find ways to make those meetings interesting. On sort of a less casual note around staying connected, I think it's really important that we find ways to um, have relationships and build on relationships that we maybe didn't have before, and maybe use this time to have some peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Schedule some coaching sessions. Maybe it's folks that you didn't think that you would have worked before with before. Um, or even find an accountability partner. Maybe check in weekly, have a laugh, encourage each other to celebrate the wins, no matter how big or how small. I had a win not that long ago with Krista. I was trying to figure out Zoom. I'd had no volume, but it wasn't Zoom. I had my volume turned off on my laptop and I didn't even realize it. So maybe it's just an opportunity to check in and to connect with someone from another department or even another province and just fi find ways to share your wins and to keep yourself on track. And before we move on to the next sec section, you can see here on the slide, it says make one commitment. So what I'd like you to do is just take a moment and make one commitment to yourself about your workspace or your work day or staying connected, something that you can easily act on and follow through on that you're going to do in terms of committing to making sure that that workspace, that work day or staying connected actually makes sense and is valuable for you. And it could be something simple as, you know, saying that you're going to play some calming music. You're going to download some calming music to do your work to. Or maybe as a manager, you're going to pre-book some one-on-one 10-minute check-ins with your staff that you didn't have time to do before. Or 
Maybe you just want to declutter your workspace and take that empty cereal bowl back to the kitchen that's been sitting on your desk since 7 a.m. So whatever it is, make that commitment to yourself. So now that we've looked at the work aspect of working from home, let's think about ourselves for a moment. So self is very important during this time, you know, self-care, making sure that we find ways to effectively either separate or blend work and personal. It's become so integrated now. So it's important for us to take a moment, take a pause, catch our breath and see what it is that we can do to ensure that we are finding that balance for ourselves. So listen to your body. Fuel your body with nutrition and exercise. And of course, I know that with the audience, I'm, I'm singing to the choir in terms of the physical activity, but we just wanna make sure that we're noting it. We wanna add laughter into the mix as well. We know that ongoing stress can really impact our immune system. So things that we can do to just release the pressure. If you wanna do a solo dance party for five minutes that you, to your favorite song, knock yourself out. Just find ways to make sure that you're listening to your body. And it's also really important for ourselves at this time to listen to our voice. And the power of language and our language choices is so critical. And as we know, positivity is contagious. So catch yourself if you're sounding negative and acknowledge it. Don't ignore it, but find out where that feeling of negativity is actually coming from. So maybe you're feeling exhausted and you're not quite sure why. So ask yourself, you know, where is that coming from? Is it physical exhaustion or emotional? Some people are exhausted because they're doing things differently now that aren't in their comfort zone. So you may be leading training sessions on Zoom and it's not something that you uh, used to do before and it's not your natural preference. So that might be exhausting you. As a manager, maybe you're catching yourself just feeling annoyed and it might just be because you're so used to having your staff in the same building and now there's a physical separation of your team. So maybe your anxiety is coming from having to find ways to keep them connected or maybe you just have to get over your own hang up about learning how to trust that your team has the ability to work independently and to be productive. So it's really important to acknowledge and listen to your voice and the, the voice in your head. So the next aspect of self is to be very purposeful and take time for you and not feel guilty about it. And maybe you need to just get creative. Maybe you can find a way to combine work and self-care. Maybe you can read a contract while you're soaking in a bubble bath. Maybe you can listen to a podcast while you're on the treadmill. So whatever you need to do to find that time for you, don't feel guilty about it. Maybe you've got a lot of dedicated time together as a family, and now it's just time to find an opportunity for alone time. You might just need to have two hours by yourself and watch a comedy and just, you know, create some lightness in your day. Maybe you could take an online training course. So self-development, really a valuable time right now to do that. LinkedIn, for example, has some very uh, quick courses. They can be as short as 30 minutes. Or maybe you've always wanted to uh, expand some academic aspect of your uh, training and you didn't have a chance to physically attend school and go to a course uh, at a classroom and now maybe you can do something virtually online. In terms of um, making sure that you're being purposeful about taking that time for you, you may be in a very small space and maybe it's an opportunity to find some indoor workout routines that are meant for hotel rooms. You know, there's uh, someone that I'm aware of that uh, is in a 900 square foot condo. There's two of them and they have an 18 month old and it's a really tight space, but um, they've actually been able to find really unique ways to work out. And it's amazing how pieces of furniture can actually be used as gym equipment. And certainly now more than ever, endorphins, right? We just, we have to laugh. We think about the last time you laughed and like a real, really a belly laugh and note down the last time that you were physical and when you were really physical. And if you can't recall these quickly or if it's been a while, then you need to make a commitment to yourself to change that. So before we move on to the third section, which was the family and friends, um, it's really important for us to acknowledge this dynamic that we're in because sometimes we feel like we're a bit out of control. 
So as an example, you know, you can't really control if your 80 year old mom doesn't really understand what working from home is. And you feel like you can't control those sort of constant interruptions that, um, that she has by reaching out to you. But you actually can. You, know, you can control by having a conversation, helping her understand. And then maybe you have a call once in the morning and once in the evening. And then she gets that dedicated quality time with you. And you can focus on work in the meantime. So a couple of questions that I'd like you to ask yourself. And if we could go to the next slide, these are just some questions about taking control. And you can have these questions handy, refer to them from time to time, because things will evolve. And it's really good for us to reflect and go back to our answers on these and update these answers uh, as things change. It gives us an opportunity to press the pause button for a moment figure out how we can uh, take control of calming the chaos and how we can find that groove around the way of working uh, when we're working from home. So what do I have control over during the day? You could have control over setting your work hours perhaps, maybe you can shut a door, maybe you have control over where in the house you work, whatever that control is and as simple as they are, um, note those things down. And then what could happen at home that might interrupt my productivity? So, you know, just think about those things in advance. It's good to be aware of them so that we know if there's going to be hungry kids or if there's going to be a dog barking or if there's going to be deliveries. Just be aware of those so that you're not surprised or upset about them. And it's one less thing that is actually going to create concern for us. And who can I get some help from or who can I offer help to? You know, we need help. Others need help, and by getting help from someone, we're taking control, and by giving help to someone, we also take control. So important things for us to ask ourselves from time to time and go back during this time to remind ourselves of those answers. So moving on to the next piece, which is the family and friends. This is the third part of working from home, that dynamic. So whether you are single and you're on your own, whether you have children at home or older parents living with you, it is a new dynamic and you want to identify what the impact is on your personal situation. We want to try and find the positive where we can because we do have additional pressures on our time. So things like keeping a routine, so start the end in the day with an element of routine, whatever that looks like for you. What's really helpful is to replace maybe what was happening before with something new. So maybe you had a commute before and you were in a car or you were on transit and that took a half an hour at the beginning of your day. Well, now just replace that commute with a walk around the block or, you know, you could knit or read for a few minutes, whatever it is, replace that time with a different activity and you still have an element of routine. Maybe pack lunches the night before. Um, if, it's, if it's you or if it's for your kids, if you have that routine, then do it. Keep that going. And then that's one less thing on your to-do list the following day. You can get a proper lunch and you, you know, can avoid sort of the mummy what's for lunch question coming up because it's already been packed the night before. Or prepare those meals on the Sunday night for the upcoming week if that's what you used to do before. That element of routine can help us. And with the help of friends or neighbors or even colleagues, maybe you can find a way to create a virtual tag team. Maybe you can occupy uh, others' kids while, while you get a break, et cetera, and you can play online games or do a workout to the wiggles or whatever it might be. There's lots of platforms for that, like Zoom and Messenger Kids. So, you know, find that way to have a virtual tag team sister to, system to occupy each other's children. Another way to have an element of control is to just set some boundaries. Maybe you put um, a sign on your door to indicate that you're busy or on the back of your chair, or you could wear a crown if that's an indication of I'm busy and can't be disturbed. I know many years ago I had a colleague, and I'm going to use a different terminology, but um, it's called the, the, the bugger off doll. <laughs> and that's not quite what she called it, but that's the polite version. And she would just put that on the corner of her desk. And that was an indication for us that she was busy developing training content and that we shouldn't interrupt her. Or maybe you can create some zones in the house, right? So, so define some areas, a co-working space over here, a craft corner or a creative corner over there, a quiet zone. So just find ways to create zones in the house that create some control. And where you can, involve the family. Make it fun. 
put kids into your agenda, show them on a clock when it is that they are going to have that meeting with you so you have one-on-one -on -one time. Maybe you bake some bread together. You use it as an opportunity to do a little bit of math where you're looking at measurements. And then when that bread is baking, those 60 uninterrupted minutes, that's your time to get some work done. And when the timer goes off, the kids know that they can come back and engage with you again. Maybe get creative. You know, at lunchtime, maybe you just leave the house. Like you just go out the front door and come right back in and pretend that it's a cafe and the kids can serve you lunch. You know, include them into your day in some way. And really important for us to enlist other family members where we can, an aunt, a cousin, grandparents, maybe they can be reading bedtime stories virtually, or maybe it can be the history lesson for the week where the grandparents can actually share some of their experiences from their life. And find help with the schoolwork. We know that this um, need to do this homeschooling has become an issue for many people. So if you can find older kids to maybe help tutor the younger ones, or maybe in your network, there's other parents who are better at a subject than you are. So maybe you can teach geography and someone else can help with the fractions. And so it's an opportunity for you to um, share in that responsibility. And certainly when it comes to those schoolwork demands, this is stressful for the kids too. So just watch out for reactions, right? If it just seems like someone's getting stressed out, put the curriculum aside for a moment, have a cuddle, have a chat, have a dance party, get physical, do something that just gives that break so that we help the kids to deal with this anxiety as well. And of course, finally, let's not forget our four-legged friends. So there's some of us who do have four-legged friends that are part of our equation. We certainly recognize that this can be anxious for them as well. I have a 12 year old dog and she takes some really long naps, but she's been interrupted because with four adults in the house now, there's a lot of activity. And so, you know, this is causing a bit of stress for her. And alternately, maybe you need a break. Maybe there's someone who can help you with the pet responsibilities. Maybe, you, maybe you're on your own and you have an opportunity to take someone's cat for a couple of weeks, give them a break, you know, yay, a pet play date. <laughs> but in terms of the pets, you know, turn on the TV or the radio or maybe play some soothing music that's geared to reducing the anxiety in pets. Uh, put a chair or their bed beside you or so that you know they're near you and they're close to you. Maybe if you're on calls and sometimes they're a little bit distracting in the background, maybe you could have some Cheerios or whatever it is and toss them one at a time to, um, to help keep the, uh, the pet uh, engaged and interested while you are busy on that call. So make sure that we're recognizing everybody, the family, the friends, the pets, um, everyone in this situation. It's important for us to acknowledge that this is different and um, again, have some grace and make sure that we're recognizing how it's affecting everyone around us. So as a brief wrap up, just in terms of regardless of the personal situation that you might have at home, this way of working is definitely going to test us, but it's certainly going to teach us. So we're going to learn more about ourselves and what we need in terms of being our own productive self. Managers are going to learn more about their teams. Managers may identify, you know, in this type of situation, who's fine with being more independent or who are those people who just might need some more frequent check-ins. But during these times, you know, it may take a while for us to, to find that groove, but remember that productivity takes many forms and it looks different for each of us. So don't feel guilty if that suggestion that you see on the internet about working at home doesn't work for you, that's okay. Strike the right balance between the work demands, your self-care and that interaction with family and friends. It's okay to not be okay all of the time, you know, despite our best efforts, there may just be days when we're not our most productive. So be kind to yourself, be kind to others as we navigate these unusual times. And remember that positivity is contagious. So thank you so much for having me. And I certainly wish you all safe and healthy working from home successes. Thank you, Michelle, so much um, for helping us to reframe our thinking and consider what factors uh, impact working from home. Um, hopefully for those of you listening, the suggestions help to trigger some thoughts and perhaps even spark some other ideas. You might have some, um, some other 
uh, things that you'd like to share with us, as I mentioned at the beginning. So please feel free to send them to us. You can email me directly at Krista, so C-H-R-I-S-T-A at CPRA.ca. And we'd be happy to share them out with everyone over the, over the coming weeks. So I'd like to uh, turn this over now to Joe Duara. He has been working from home for 20 years and he's gonna take a moment to share a couple of the ways in which he has made that uh, successful. So while Joe is um, sharing his screen and unmuting himself, um, I just will take a minute to introduce Joe. Joe has been an advocate and a champion supporting physical activity, sport and recreation policy and promotion in Canada for over 30 years. Joe has been working from his home-based office in Halifax, Nova Scotia for over two decades. So for over 20 years, ending in 2019, Joe was Senior Advisor and Manager of Healthy Living, reporting to Ottawa for the Public Health Agency of Canada. As a longtime distance employee, Joe has used innovative strategies to support effective telecommuting long before it was actually a trend. Currently, Joe is a home-based independent consultant providing services in facilitation, strategic planning, project management, partnership development, public speaking, and thought leadership in healthy public policy. And Joe's now going to offer some brief tips and tricks to making your home-based work experience manageable, productive, and fun. So Joe, thank you so much for doing this and for being here, and I will turn this uh, presentation over to you. Wonderful, Krista. Thank you so much for uh, having me. And, and Michelle, thank you for all of the excellent uh, anecdotes and the wonderful recommendations. I know that among the 200 plus uh, participants on today's webinar, uh, all of them are going to benefit by that insight and those recommendations. So what I'm going to do is what Krista noted, just maybe drill down a little bit and give some tips and tricks that have worked for me over the 20 years that I've been telecommuting from Halifax to Ottawa and really working across the country with any number of uh, public, private, and not-for-profit uh, uh, partners across um, Canada over the years. And they're going to be in the category of the work. Obviously, Michelle talked about family and talked about um, the uh, importance of focusing on self. I'm going to stick to the work tips and tricks. And they're going to be in two buckets. And I'm going to take about five, seven minutes to do this. So the first bucket is in the real critical importance of attempting to be more visible when in fact we can't be with our colleagues or our clients. Now, you may first conclude that being visible sounds kind of counterintuitive given that we are alone. We are now working from home. We can't just walk over to the next cubicle and check in with our colleague or work with our colleague. But when I started working from home 20 years ago, my biggest fear was that I was going to be forgotten. And there's a quote that says, to be invisible is to be forgotten. And so I put in several tips and tricks that I've used over the years that have been very, very helpful to help my colleagues first remember me and second to see me in ways that uh, are pr productive and helpful uh, when they actually can't see me in person. And there are five of them. So the first is to send regular, unsolicited, short status reports of your work to your colleagues. Now, I, I say short, I mean only about two lines. It does not have to be a tome of information. And I say unsolicited because herein lies the opportunity to be visible. These are unexpected little short updates to your colleagues or your clients that bring you to mind because they receive them in their email box. And so here's an example. Uh, John, I'm working on the recreation plan uh, for our partners uh, in the East Coast. I expect to have a full draft to you by noon on Wednesday. That's it. Send that along to your client or send that along to your colleagues. Uh, they'll remember that you're focused on your task at home, that you are progressing with your work, and that you are now more visible in their mind and in their inbox. And so that's one helpful tip that I've used over the years. years. The second is to over deliver. And I mean just a little bit. I know that we have a lot on our plates now in the context of this 
new reality that we're living in. So I'm not suggesting that you work harder, but really just a little bit smarter. By over delivering a little bit, by giving your colleagues or your clients just a little bit more than they expect, it makes you more visible. They stand up or sit up and listen and say to themselves, oh, I didn't expect that, but that's a helpful addition to the task that he or she was, was um, uh, supposed to deliver to us. So over deliver just a little bit. The third is in the area of, of giving praise. And I don't mean um, uh, praise that is not uh, real. I mean praise that is, is something that you've acknowledged or you've recognized some very good piece of work from your colleagues. And whether it be on a scheduled uh, video conference or whether it be in a, a bilateral discussion, make sure that you acknowledge that they're doing a good job as well. Because remember, as I think we all are, are gaining a, a clear understanding of now, is literally the world is in this situation. This is not a Canadian issue, it is a global issue. And everyone needs to feel that they are um, contributing and that they are doing a good job. So um, some, some praise every now and then will help them to feel more comfortable and help you become more visible because they'll appreciate that. The fourth thing is what I call offer to chair or share. And so we are all required to be on regularly scheduled team meetings, video conferencing, teleconferencing. One of the ways that you can be more visible is plan ahead to suggest that you could take on the reins to chair a meeting um, and suggest perhaps that the rotation of that chair role uh, goes around to other colleagues as well. It takes the pressure off of your manager or your otherwise superior, but allows you also to become more visible. So chair a meeting. On the share front, what you can always do is plan ahead to share a piece of information that is otherwise not scheduled on the meeting, but is in tune with the agenda. So be proactive and get ready in advance so you're not having to think about how, having to fit into the conversation as it unfolds. So prepare to share in advance. The last is related to a point that Michelle made so very well, and that is on the issue of being present in video conferencing in particular because people can see you, but also on teleconferencing or in other ways. And I've used three really quick uh, tips over the years to be more present and therefore more visible to my colleagues and my clients. One is I always ask a question. Two is I always offer an observation. And three, I always bring a solution to the discussion. If you do those three things, you will find that you'll become more visible, you'll demonstrate your leadership, you'll demonstrate that you're present and connected to the conversation and the discussion, the important discussion that's taking place. So those five tips on the staying visible front has worked, have worked for me over the years. The next bucket of tips and tricks that I'll offer you is also in that work category uh, and it, relates to being organized. Now I'll pause here and I'll just say that Michelle has made an excellent point and given you some really helpful ideas about how to find that balance between being overly organized and maybe too flexible. You're going to find some type of a middle ground or you're probably going to be one a little further along the spectrum on one side to the other. And that's entirely okay. Michelle has made the good point that, that uh, there's no one size fits all. But we do have to be somewhat organized. And on that front, remember a couple of things. One is that all of your colleagues are attempting to do the same thing. So if you're not entirely um, comfortable in terms of delivering on your skills and your, your responsibilities and trying to get organized in the first instance. It will take time. That's okay because everyone is in this together. So here are five tips and I'll just begin by saying that uh, um, a, another saying is that for every minute that you plan to organize you gain one hour in, in uh, productivity. So keep that in mind as well. So the first is 
do what I've done over the years. Regardless of whether or not you're building your workday uh, in, in, in chunks, as Michelle say, you, says you may be working in the morning, come back to your desk in the afternoon, putting some time in the evening. What I've done over the years is I've used a 3-1-3 framework. And what that means is assuming you're working about a seven hour day, I've broken my day into the three first hours, the one hour uh, break for lunch and some physical activity, and the second three hours. Plan ahead, generally speaking, uh, with broad strokes to know what amount of work, focus on work, what accomplishments you want to achieve in the first three hours. Make sure you do take that break, whether it be an hour at once or two half hour time periods to ensure that you're taking care of the self, that you're sure that you're, sure that you're remaining connected to family and friends, as Michelle has given us some really good advice to do. And in the last three hours, do the same. Generally frame out what it was you want to accomplish and how you're going to get that done. The second thing is to arrive at your workstation, wherever it is, in the closet, in the rec room, in your bedroom, or in an office like I have, uh, about five minutes early. This is perhaps more important in the current circumstances than it was before, because by arriving early, you can take a breath. You can get yourself grounded. You can separate yourself from the activity that you were involved with previously, whether it be spending time with family, whether it be checking in with neighbors, whatever it was. But arrive a little bit early, take a breath, get your head around the task at hand, particularly if you're going to be going into a video conference or teleconference, and you'll be more prepared. And do that on the, act, the back end of the day as well. Take about five minutes to uh, reflect on your day, to see how it went in terms of meeting your, your productivity goals. Uh, but also think ahead to tomorrow's day. See what's in front of you. Just visualize this so you can begin to get your head around being as productive as you can uh, tomorrow. The third thing is if you can if you want and you can get permission from your colleagues, I have over the years often audio taped my, uh, my phone meetings. This allows you to go back and delve into the details that sometimes you miss because there are just too many of them. Why this may be really more important now is because as Michelle has made very uh, clear, rightly so, uh, we may find ourselves in a situation where there are more distractions and you may miss something. So the opportunity to audio tape your, um, your uh, teleconferences uh, may help you there. And of course, when you uh, video conference your team meetings, uh, those are often archived and you can go back to those as well. The fourth thing is to take meetings on your desktop, not on your smartphone, right? Regularly scheduled meetings on your desktop like you see me here and not on your smartphone. There are so many reasons why this is important, but a couple of them are when you present yourself in front of your desktop, you present yourself in a stable position. We've seen so many examples, haven't we, over the uh, internet over the last several weeks of where people are using their smartphones and they are doing so while moving around the house uh, they're showing their, their decorating skills and they don't intend to uh, of, of their living room or their uh, rec room or wherever. And moving around also presents a distraction. So it's really important to be um, focused and in a place where you can present yourself um, in one stable position and not be a distraction to your colleagues. The other reason is because um, you can present yourself in a way that is, um, um, I think, much more, uh, uh, um, much more attractive in, in the sense that a lot of people are not used to being on, on video conference with, with, uh, at, with working from home. And in using their phone, they often video themselves from down here or from up there or from sideways and you're perhaps not literally putting your best face forward. And so being stable in one place on your desktop allows you to do that. The last thing is 
notes. Michelle has made this point as well, but I want to reiterate that while you may not have the responsibility or usually uh, do take notes while you're working in your office on a regular basis, you should do this at home while you're working because it gives you a focus. Once you write something down, you're more apt to remember it. And when I say notes, I don't mean minutes, not detailed notes, because then you're not focused right on the, on the, the meeting at hand. I mean only two things. Uh, decisions that have been made in your video conference or teleconference and action steps. These are the things that you need to remember for sure to be able to take the next steps in uh, contributing to uh, the work at hand with your colleagues and your clients. And so lastly, let me just point out that as has been said already on the teleconference, but, but it, it really needs to be um, ingrained, I think, in our thinking as we all move forward uh, for the medium term, right? Because as Michelle has also said, this is not a short term situation that we find ourselves. And that is that we need to think about how we manage ourselves generally at work with our family, uh, with our friends and with ourselves. And I've written a little bit of a thought leadership piece on this that I published on, in, on LinkedIn. You can find me there. And it speaks to uh, five uh, characteristics of, of or traits that Canadians are actually well known for. And that's passion, um, resolve, ingenuity, caring, and empathy. You may notice that when you spell those out, you get an acronym the acronym PRICE, P-R-I-C-E. And my take on this was that this is the price that we must pay in order, in the short term, in order to get through uh, these uh, troubled and uncertain and anxious times, and we will get through. Uh, you may wanna check out that thought leadership piece on LinkedIn, and I hope that you can find it. I hope that it's helpful to you. If, if it is, share it. Um, thank you, Krista, for having, uh, and CPRA for having me uh, here today. And Michelle, again, thank you for your excellent uh, anecdotes and uh, guidance that I know is going to be so helpful to everyone here today. So thanks very much. Well, thank you, Joe. I'll add my thanks to both of you. So to Joe for your work tips and tricks, so many great ideas. Uh, and for all of your uh, 20, 30 years of service, more like 30 years of service to the physical activity, sport, and recreation sector. Um, to both Michelle and Joe, my thanks for your time and expertise today. Your advice and ideas are extremely important during these times, but I suspect that they'll endure over the months and possibly years to come as people may remain working from home. To all of you who have taken the time to listen to the webinar, I hope that you've taken away some great tips and ideas. Um, and on behalf of CPRA and my colleagues on the webinar today, I hope you find ways to stay well physically, mentally, and emotionally during these trying times. Uh, as we always hear, we are in this together and we'll overcome the challenges with each other's care and support. So thank you again for joining us today. Have a great day.